The bond market suggests a liquidity crisis is imminent, consumer sentiment is crashing, and workers? Well, they're quitting their jobs in droves. All that and more on today's show. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today as we're coming at you from an undisclosed location as a kingdom as the bond vigilantes are back and driving volatility higher, which most people misunderstand because the bond market doesn't function quite like the equity market. Typically, when we see equity volatility rising, that means prices are falling. And in the moment, it's meaning the same thing with the bond market. But remember, what most people don't understand is that volatility is a knife that can cut two directions. Heightened volatility just tells you that prices are going to swing a lot in one direction or the other, but it doesn't mean that interest rates are going up now. Does it mean that? Well, maybe not. Let's take a look and pick up this story where the U.S. Treasury market is the most treacherous since the pandemic's onset as the bond market liquidity volatility gauges signal distress. And the Fred's, Fed's credibility as an inflation fighter is dented, says one analyst. Well, look, let's face it. The Fed's credibility has long since been dented. The issue we face here is not the Fed's inability to fight inflation. We have to remember it's the type of inflation the Fed is fighting. If it's monetary inflation, an expansion of the money supply and money printing, well, the Fed is well equipped to do that. Supply chain inflation? Well, it's not the Fed's specialty, and they got it wrong in 2008. And they're about to get it wrong again. Let's keep going. All right, here we can see as bond traders around the world try to force central banks to respond to elevated inflation rates, unusually large price swings have taken their toll. Signs have emerged of a vicious cycle in which a reluctance to participate in the market impairs liquidity, making large price swings even more likely. And what you're seeing here is a negative reaction to the Fed tapering. And this isn't unusual. We saw this after quantitative easing three ended, and we kind of saw a little bit of it after QE1 and QE2 ended, where traders are just trying to force the Fed back to the table, and that's not gonna happen. So they're aggressively shorting the bond market. So the question you might be wondering is, well, where are all the buyers going? Well, we're gonna show you where all the buyers are going because the buyers realize that if the sellers keep getting their way, they're gonna be able to buy at lower prices, and that's what the buyers really, really want right now. Let's continue on. As we can see, as measured by Bloomberg's US Government Securities Liquidity Index, trading conditions in treasuries are the worst since March 2020. Now remember what happened in March 2020, my friends, is yields went up and then they came crashing down. So this is not necessarily a bad thing for the bond market, it actually means danger is coming from the equity market as a liquidity crisis, well, is imminent. Let's continue on. As we can see, when the pandemic spurred massive central bank intervention around the world, the index measures deviations in yields from a fair value model. As far as expected volatility, the ICE B of A move index for U.S. bonds is near the highest since April 2020. And why is that? Again, this is a supply-related issue. You can see here from last week, Treasury bill at dealers dropped almost in half from 48 billion to 27 billion. Let's take a look at the rest of the curve. Look at two years, went from 23 and a half down to just over 15 billion. How about this three year treasury notes? Get this, negative 13.6 billion cash balance at the dealers. What does that mean? Speculators are massively short three years, there's an insufficient supply. And that's why you're seeing volatility here is there's an insuff insufficient supply. How about we go out the curve a bit into the five-year space, 13.6 billion down from uh, prior week. How about the seven-year went from 12 to 7.8 billion? We'll continue on to the 10-year, which was negative, but thanks to the auctions, now slightly positive 1.9 because again, speculators are massively short and what are the buyers doing? Well, they're just sitting back and letting people short and soak up all that inventory. Even the long bond, the 20 and 30 year bond, their inventory dropped to 45 billion, which it hasn't seen in weeks. And why is that? Because these trading dislocations, these bond dislocations that make these conditions the roughest since the pandemic. And here you can see that ICE chart of the move index starting to rise and you see treasury liquidity. We'll look at a different version of this in a bit and you can see it coming down and what happens that leads to a spike in equity volatility and ultimately a massive shift into bonds because I'm gonna show you just how short 
the actual retail buyers are in terms of the bond index or bonds, they don't own hardly any. And when this happens, they start flooding in. Let's continue on with the story. As we can see, speculators, now we haven't got the most recent information. It's coming out today, so we'll have it for Wednesday's show. We see net spec positions in 10-year treasury note futures massively diving the week before. My prediction is we'll see this drop even more as speculators go heavily short the 10-year. But what about the 30-year? Well, they had backed off their short positions the last few weeks, but I'll bet we see a massive increase in net short positions by speculators as they go and put all their chips all in on this short vault, short bond trade, betting on higher interest rates and lower yields. The question you should ask, the question I'm asking, well, are they gonna be wrong? Well, I'm gonna show you they are. Cracks appear in the world's biggest bond market as the Fed pulls back. Again, what is suggesting what the bond, what the traders are trying to do is tell the Fed, you're making a huge mistake. It's not the Fed that's making a mistake, it's all of these traders as liquidity erodes amid a surge of volatility and yields. The Fed is reducing the amount of treasuries it buys each month, but also as we talked about last week, the treasury is also issuing fewer bonds. They're actually scaling back their issuance of notes and bonds to prioritize issuance of bills. Because remember, there's this massive overnight repo problem where all these money market funds are still parked at the Fed to the tune of over a trillion dollars, and there's a bill shortage. So the treasury is finally doing what I said they should do a long time ago, which is reduce their note and bond issuance. And they are, at the same time, the Fed's reducing its purchases. So it's really not a big shift yet, but the bond market is, or the traders are going and acting like it's the end of the world. Let's keep going here. And what do we see here? The urgency may grow by then. The Fed, which is steadily buying treasury since the onset of the pandemic, nearly froze trading, is implementing plans to start scaling back its buying by 10 billion a month. And while regulators are meeting, this was last week, the Treasury Department will hold its monthly auction of 20-year bonds, providing a test of whether this week's 30-year sale was an anomaly or well, actually we're getting the 30-year the was an anomaly. We're getting the 20-year this week or a sign that the market's ability to function smoothly may be imperiled as the central bank withdraws its support. We'll find that out soon enough. The current structure enables the market to function well when volumes are running around average levels. And they're not right now, but it leads to these periods of large and aggressive moves that seem inexplicable relative to the data. It also makes it hard for asset managers to manage their risk, and that is true. And here you can see the Bloomberg gauge of treasury liquidity, this kind of a reverse of the other chart, show the worst since 2020 as liquidity conditions dry up. And it starts to make sense because asset managers get really nervous when volatility increases, and what do they end up doing? Selling, and so that is a problem, but the buyers are still absorbing all of this up. They're just taking advantage of it because when you see what I'm about to show you, you're gonna say, no way are yields headed higher. They're gonna head lower. And all these people that are short are gonna be massively wrong at a bad time. Let's keep going here. The recent swings in the treasury market reflect the broad uncertainty about the direction of the economy and monetary policy amid surging prices, labor shortages, and yields that are holding well below the rate of inflation. And well, I think that's the issue is, about all of this. Is it surging prices the problem? No. Because have you ever found that you pay a higher rate if the price of something is higher? Usually you pay a lower rate. Is it a labor issue? Not so much. I think the real issue here is yields. Everybody thinks that yields have to rise with inflation. And the question we have addressed and we'll continue to, are they wrong? And the answer is, Yes, they are. Here you can see I've got the consumer price index on a year over year rate change against the market yield of 30 year treasuries. And what do you see when inflation spikes? Well, let's go back to the great financial crisis. It's the closest setup to what we're seeing now. We saw inflation spike up and what happened? As it went up and made its final throw higher, there was a little bit of backup in yield and then they started the 30 year trended lower and then came crashing straight down and inflation came crashing down with it. In fact, when you as we continue, we see every time the CBI gets too high, the yields go down. CBI gets too high, yields go down. And why is that? I want to challenge you. Why is that going on? What are you seeing here? 
why are yields going down when consumer prices go up? Because that seems to be the opposite of what most people think. They think higher consumer prices must be inflationary. Inflationary must lead to higher interest rates. Again, it's the type of inflation. That's what I want you to be thinking about. If higher consumer prices were due to something such as, say, money printing, then it would make logical sense. And you could go back to the 1970s when you saw the money supply expanding and what happened? Yields had to rise to soak up that money. Think of it like a mop and you spilled water on the floor and you've got to soak up that that water. Well, that's what the bond market does with higher yields when there's times of rapid money supply expansion. But when consumer prices rise due to supply chain issues or other issues unrelated to an expansion of the money supply, well, you're not mopping up excess water in this case. You need to actually put water into the system and what you need is yields to go down to create money enough money to support these higher prices or they get rejected and so that's why we should be seeing yields fall at a time when speculators are again all in on this bet and they're going to be wrong just as they've been wrong in the past and you can see here again in 2017 and 18 consumer prices started to rise and yields went down and here the, you see it again now the consumer prices going off the charts everybody now thinks that that means treasury yields must go to four or five percent and what's going to happen is they're going to go to new all-time lows let's keep looking because households don't own any bonds i mean they they if you want to talk about being short something there's two ways to be short you can actually bet against something so you can be a speculator will bet against the bond market by shorting it and trying to profit on bond prices going down but you can also be short something by not owning it well look at this households don't own any bonds hardly and you can see here in yellow this is the equity positioning percentage of total financial assets reported on the federal feds flow of funds in terms of household holdings and you can see equity positioning at massive highs and what is debt that is in the light blue and it's at all-time lows going back to the 1950s so americans don't own any bonds in their portfolio or very few and they're underweight so they are also short the bond market which makes this interesting of why yields are not substantially higher when speculators are shorting it and households don't own them but wait till speculators have to unwind those short positions and households decide they want some safety of the bond market and then you'll see the kingdom rise again let's keep going with this because it gets even better this is a phenomenal chart i pulled off of twitter uh, this is something that i have shared in the past but this chart is much better than mine and what you see here is 10-year treasuries when you see a double top where the square box is yields go and make new all-time lows and here you see a double top new all-time lows this is a almost a triple top new all-time lows double top new all-time lows double top suggesting we're going to break through and see 10-year treasuries potentially go to zero or even negative and wow that would bring a lot of the, and you're saying but what that can't, that can't happen when you realize that everybody the speculators are massively short and households don't own there's a massive amount of buying power waiting to come in the market when there's a risk off move and all the bond market is telling us as it becomes a little bit less liquid so there's a big risk off move coming and we can see that as we look start to look into the consumer sentiment data and other data points let's first start with the national federation of independent businesses small business outlook for general business conditions and what you see is this is absolutely tanking it's in white there's some moving averages uh, in the different colors but you can see it's as low as it was back in 2012 going into 2013 and it was not that low even it's not even was not even this low during the great financial crisis so small businesses are saying look this is terrible for business conditions but how about one of my favorite if you want to know what I really love, one of my favorite economic indicators, University of Michigan, we get it twice a month. We get the preliminary, which we're going to look at now, and then we get the official, and it tells you what consumers are thinking. And when the consumers are thinking things are bad, what do they do with their wallets? Well, they keep them in their pocket. So let's take a look at what's going on here. University of Michigan sentiment survey collapses to 11-year lows. Inflation expectations surge. But is that bad for bonds? No. 
not so quick. Here we go right to the report itself. Surveys of consumers from the chief economist. Consumer sentiment fell in early November to its lowest level in a decade due to an escalating inflation rate and the growing belief among consumers that no effective policies, none, no effective policies have yet been developed to reduce the damage from surging inflation. One in four consumers, can you imagine this? One in four consumers, 25% of them cited inflationary reductions in their living standards. Now we already knew that was happening because we saw real personal disposable incomes going negative on a year over year basis. I told you this was happening, but can you imagine 25%? Wow, that's staggering. Uh, in November with other, with lower income and older consumers voicing the greatest impact because their their incomes are not able to adjust. Nominal income gains were widely reported, but again, so incomes went up, but when asked about inflation adjusted gains, the only thing that matters, how far does your paycheck go? Half of, half of all families anticipated reduced real or inflation adjusted incomes next year. Wow. And here we see the preliminary results for November 2021. October, looking at the broad consumer sentiment index fell from 71.7 .7 to 66.8. Current conditions 77.7 .7 down to 73.2. I'll show you in a graph in a second. And future expectations plunging 67.9 down to 62.8. And here you can see that consumer confidence is breaking below, starting to break below the expectation is now below where it was during the pandemic, consumer sentiment below, and we see current conditions right at or right just touch below where they were at the worst point in the pandemic. So consumers are saying it's now worse than it was then, and at the rate it's going, well, we're going to get below where it was in 2011, or at least down to those lows. And what was going on in 2011? If you remember, we were facing a double dip recession from the great financial crisis, Things are looking bad. And how about bad? You look at buying conditions. Now, let's say you're in the market for a house. This is good. What this is telling you is there's a good time to buy is coming. If you're thinking about selling, it's telling you you better sell it now. Same thing for vehicles. Same thing for large household durables. You can see multi-decade lows that buying conditions for these are terrible. And this is what this is telling you. Consumers are going to cut and stop buying homes, stop buying cars, and stop buying large durables. So if you have things to sell, you might want to get on it. And if you're thinking about buying, well, maybe you ought to wait because it's suggesting the pricing for the buyers is going to get a lot better as deflation hits homes, vehicles, and durable goods. This is a great piece from Arbor Data Science looking at the Z-scored University of Michigan buying conditions, suggesting that household durables are at the worst since the 1980s, homes are almost at the worst and vehicles are uh, below the worst conditions since they've been tracking this data back to the 1980s. So the question we should be asking is, you know, how bad is the situation? Now, remember last week we did a piece on panic in the White House that this could be dangerous going into the midterms, the 10 when consumer prices rise and incomes don't rise enough, that people vote out the, the party in power, it doesn't matter who they are, they vote them out because if their pocketbooks are impacted and they don't know what to do, well, they believe a change is coming. And here you can see for sure the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment polls by political party, uh, Democrats, Republicans, independents, all going down, saying that they're not supportive of what's going on with Democrats holding on for now, but we'll suspect that as consumer prices stay up and incomes don't keep up, that look for a political change coming. And now we go back with the University of Michigan inflation expectations. I want to, this is a really cool indicator. I'm going to show you a really cool chart here in a moment that shows just how wrong investors get inflation ex expectations. In fact, when you look at this chart, if you're not bond bullish now, well, you might be after this. Check this out. So this shows the one-year inflation expectations in red and the five and 10 years. So seeing inflation expectations are the highest it's been since 2008, notably when oil prices were at 120 a barrel. Where does this go from here? Well, I found this in the Fred database. It didn't actually know they had it, but I went looking for it. And this is really cool. It shows inflation expectations in blue. So the same chart there. And in red, I've got 10-year treasury yields. So as inflation expectations peak, you tend to get a peak here in yields, and then they both come down. And look, look what happened here, though. Let's move more into our modern economy. Inflation expectations rose during the great financial crisis. 
again, this was a crude oil issue. What happened? Yields had come down. They backed up a little bit. Everyone thought this was it. And then they came straight crashing down as inflation expectations went down with it. What do you think is going to happen now? You see inflation expectations high here in 2011 and yields went down. Inflation expectations high. Where do you think yields are headed? Down. Let's take a look at what this means for the stock market. Investor sentiment uh, in black, which be is considered the S&P. They're charting the S&P 500 again. Consumer confidence going down. What they're telling you is investors are really bullish on stocks. Consumer confidence is telling you stocks are going way down. And how about what does that mean for again for yields? Let's take a look at consumer sentiment here back at the Fred database, looking at market yields of 10 year treasuries. And what do we see here when consumer sentiment is high or is starting to come down from a high? What happens to yields? They go down. And there are periods when it backs up a little bit. You can see consumer sentiment backing up, yields kind of coming up, and then all of a sudden consumer sentiment crashing, yields go down. And here you can see consumer sentiment crashing, yields went down, consumer sentiment backed up, yields kind of pushed up a little bit. Everyone still thinks these are going sky high, consumer sentiment crashing. Where do you think yields are going? That's right, the liquidity crisis. Do you start to understand why the buyers are backing out here? They just know this is a phenomenal opportunity for them. So they're letting the volatility pick up. They're picking up what they can as sellers are forced to sell or they want to sell. And then all because they know when this volatility keeps going, the narrative is going to flip and all of a sudden bond prices are going higher. And the liquidity crisis, well, turns into an equity crisis. Here we can see the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey versus the federal funds rate. The federal funds rate, every time it goes down, it predicts a collapse in consumer sentiment, if you can imagine that. And what do we see? Keeping inflation up. Ships keep coming, pushing U.S. port logjam and weights to record. So we're not getting goods and two shelves fast enough. This will keep inflation probably elevated a little bit longer than it needs to be. And that will continue to keep consumers from spending as much as they can, leading to a further reduction in spending and a slowdown in the economy. The logjam of container ships outside the California ports of Los Angeles, Long Beach, swelled to another record as stepped up efforts to clear the cargo off the docks failed to prevent the average wait time from vessels from reaching nearly 17 days. So we have still supply chain disruptions that are causing all this problem. And Biden now says that the infrastructure bill will ease inflation pressures. Well, I think I disagree with that one because he says a $550 billion bill will create millions of jobs and those people, those workers will go back and that will help ease inflation. The problem we have is the job openings and labor turnover survey says we have about 10.4 million jobs available now. So it's not a jobs issue, Mr. President. This is a problem with people not wanting to go back to work for reasons perhaps do still due to pandemic, perhaps the stock market's up, maybe they're all turned into crypto traders, who knows, but the so-called quits rate, a measurement of workers leaving jobs as a share of overall employment was 3% of September record high. Friday's labor department data showed a sign of worker confidence in the job market, total quits, which reflect the jobs that workers left voluntarily hit another record of 4.4 million. They're saying, hey, you can take this job and shove it. It's not a jobs issue. It's not a jobs issue, it's a crude oil issue. This is one thing a president can affect. Oil declines as Biden faces mounting calls from a strategic petroleum reserve release. As Senate Majority Leader Schumer says drivers need help at the pump. He knows, he understands what's going on here. And the Biden administration official says all options remain on the table. And here you can see crude oil prices on a year over year or dollar per barrel against treasury yields when crude prices go down. Yields go down. Look, the, all the bond market is really telling you here is it knows where this whole story is going. And this short little tiny backup in yields over this last week is not a big deal. You can see the overall trend is going to lead to not just lower yields, new all-time lows in yields, and that'll bring stocks down with it. And with that, that's our show. Thanks for being fans. Thanks for supporting the show. We'll see you back on Wednesday. I'm Steve Van Meter. Bye now. The content of this video is provided as educational information only. is not intended to provide investment or other advice. This chill is not to be construed as a, as a recommendation or solicitation to buy or sell a security, financial instrument, or to participate in any particular trading strategy. This video was prepared by Steve Van Miro. Personal capacity, this, this video was, uh, is not to be, uh, but, but, let me see. Um, 
Alice Fam. I, I forget the rest. But uh, anyways, read the disclosure because it says something about Atlas Financial Advisors, Inc. and Stephen Van Meter Financial um, are to be held harmless or something else. Anyways, <laughs> bye.